Okay, that countdown timer got my pulse pounding. So thanks everyone for joining me today for this session with Google. It's called Peak Season Recommendations for PMAX, Trend, Tactics, and Outlook. Um, just a quick word about myself, or actually, I'd rather talk about the wonderful company I work for, Smarter Ecommerce, also known as SMEC, um, because it's really because of the, the people that I work with that I'm able to do what I do. I, I'm lucky to stand on the shoulders of all kinds of really smart people. And also we've got these wonderfully collaborative clients um, without whom nothing would be possible. So I also want to thank uh, Google's CSS partner program for the excellent organization of this event and also for uh, making this possible too. Um, moving on to today's agenda. <clears throat> We're going to cover a bit of context here. I'm kind of a context person. I feel like context is always really important. It's the key to understanding and it's the key to delivering. Um, that'll mean what is so special about Q4 2022, this first post-pandemic, if we can call it that, um, holiday season, and <clears throat> how PMAX fits into that picture. And then I'll walk through a handful of tips um, regarding measurement, seasonality, competition, incrementality. You know, there's already wonderful tips out there. Even there's a great uh, webinar from Google about preparing for the 2022 holiday season. And they talk about those um, really pragmatic things like, um, you know, having seasonal campaigns or holiday campaigns, having holiday asset groups dedicated for your holiday assets, um, connecting your promotional URLs to those holiday assets. Um, so this kind of thing is is really important, but it's been covered before. And that's why I want to talk about uh, some other things in, in this. And then I'll hand over to Susanna Liu from Google. She's a global product lead for um, Performance Max e-commerce. And she'll talk a bit more on this Outlook side. She'll talk, she'll talk about her take on Performance Max and also a bit of the roadmap um, so we can understand how this all fits together and why it's important. We'll come back to me and um, I'll handle question and answers. So just regarding some ground rules, um, basically not a lot of rules out there. Just I would encourage you to uh, share questions at any time. Uh, don't wait till the end. Don't be shy. You can put them into your chat. Um, and then depending on how much time we, ha we have at the end, we'll cover as many of those as we can. So first, a question that I have um, What's up with Black Friday? I like to use this uh, as kind of a, yeah, this benchmark or litmus test for what's going on with the holiday season because it does tend to be that most acute point or that peak of the holiday season. And if we look at Black Friday, 2021, 2020, and back to 2019, we see that the black line there, 2020, and the, the medium gray line are actually lower in volume than 2019. Um, so there's questions about why that could be occurring. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the huge offline proportion of Black Friday as an event. Um, it's not only an online event, because what we've seen is that online in 2021, the sales were um, strong. They were moderately over 2020, and 2020 was a record-breaking Black Friday. So this the search intent is is interesting to me. I, I think we're going to see a return to more offline research as lockdowns loosen. Um, and the other thing I like to mention is that all this interest and demand is occurring earlier in the season every year. We also see it for um, more generic queries, seasonal queries like gifts and so on, gifting. Uh, th these things just start earlier and earlier. So it's important to prepare now. And Let's get stringent. Uh, that's the next section I want to talk with you about. And, uh, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist. It's not my business to say if we're in a post-pandemic situation or not. I think the important thing to remember is that this is unprecedented and could change at any time. Um, you never know if there's going to be a new variant of concern coming out or anything like that. But over the last quarters, we've seen that stringency, which is basically Oxford University's measure of how strict or severe lockdown um, and public health measures are related to COVID. Over the last quarters, we've seen that that's consistently declining. And in the right-hand chart, if you look at the purple or blue bars compared to the black bars, you'll see that in these three key markets, um, things were notably softer and more open than they were in Q4 2020. 
And why that's significant in e-commerce, I've taken here that stringency data and compared it against the timeline of Google's retail mobility data because they have this data from Google Maps and so on. They know when people are visiting retail locations. And we see that these two things, pretty intuitively, they move in opposite from each other. As uh, lockdowns and public health measures and concern over the virus um, increases, then people stop going to, to brick and mortar stores less. And this has impacts on e-commerce. Um, that's largely what drove, if you look in the right-hand chart, the big bubble in, in the purple line there in e-commerce growth year over year. That bubble occurred in perfect lockstep with an increase in stringency. And then year-over-year -year effects kicked in, and that's kind of the challenging position that we're in right now where it's hard to show growth year-over-year. -year. This is compounded by supply chain problems, record inflation, which also inflates growth numbers, by the way. Um, and it also suppresses demand. We see uncertain demand going forward into the future. So <clears throat> if that all sounds like doom and gloom, um, you can at least take consolation knowing that we're all in this together. Everyone's facing a similar environment. We all face the same challenges. But what's clear is that the competition is here and there's an urgent performance mandate. So that's where Google steps in with Google's performance max campaigns. And um, yeah, from that performance mandate to the promise of maximum performance, what this is about is a single campaign type that offers a unified buying service to all Google Ads inventory. So it's this very full funnel, you might call it, or multi-channel, multi-format, uh, multi-placement kind of campaign that should cover all the inventory. And Google's great promise there is on the basis of their audience data that they're able to kind of graph and understand product, placement, audience, and serve the right ads at the right moment. And, <coughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold a little bit. Um, we see that Pmax has arrived. Pmax is here. And it's been a, actually a startling fast adoption uh, for Performance Max, where this is the share of costs compared to smart shopping. And you can see that in less than a year, it went to 100%. Now, of course, this was a planned migration, so that's a part of it. But nevertheless, this is one of the biggest shifts in um, Google Ads recent history, or maybe ever in Google Ads. So uh, the things come together here where we've got kind of uh, very challenging and uncertain quarter four ahead. We're in a challenging macro environment, and we're also seeing new technology coming on the market. There's other things too, like changes to um, the way that Google search functions, uh, Google search ads, changes to Google Analytics. There's a lot of change out there. What does success look like in this context, in the age of automation, where things are at this point much more automated than they've been in the past? Um, well, I like to say that this is more than just kind of a, a game of clicks or a game of CPC in the past. We used to report to our clients and we used to observe what was going on with CPC per hour on Black Friday. And that's what the red part of this heat map is. It's CPC. And then the gray part are the clicks on an hourly basis on Black Friday. And what I encourage people to do now is to think about the green bars here, which is a, a metric that many of you might not be reporting, and that's value per click. Um, and the reason why is that cost per click is largely owned by the machines at this point. It's largely automated. Uh, on the other hand, value per click is something where we're most capable and probably always where our priority should have been to, to influence this. Because cost per click, let me put it this way as well. When we're talking about a possible economic recession ahead, a possible advertising recession where budgets are getting challenged, where performance is getting challenged. Um, if you're viewing everything through the lens of cost per click and, and so on, then Google Ads is nothing more than a cost center for you. And cost centers don't do well in an environment like that typically. Whereas if you view things through value per click, it's a different mindset. It's going to cause you to take different actions. And this turns Google Ads into what it should be, which is a value center, a value creation center, not just a cost center. Um, I love this quote from Niels Gruber. He's, uh, he's the head of 
uh, smart bidding and automation at Google in uh, Europe and actually EMEA in the European Middle East and Africa region. And he has this great quote. It's the start of an awesome article from him. He says, when everyone's doing the same thing, it's difficult to stand out. And he goes on to mention that uh, smart bidding is and automated bidding in different forms through Pmax, et cetera, is easily accounting for 80% of the market at this point. So again, that's that topic that CPCs are rather commoditized. Uh, the question becomes, how do you differentiate? And he recommends as well, differentiating on value. Uh, so if we think about value per click, just not to belabor, to belabor the point, to, to get in a little bit more detail. If we think about value per click in relation to cost per click, those two things held next to each other. The value per click is the, re the return part of ROAS on a per click basis. And the cost per click is then the ad spend part on a per click basis. So value per click is this wonderful metric that on a per click on an auction basis is about conversion rate and average order value coming together. And these are the things that we can really influence, not just in the campaign. That's an important part too, but also with our on-site activities and all of our different kind of off-channel activities, what offer we put forward. These are the way that we can influence these things. And it's where our efforts should be focused. So I think that's an important mindset shift going into this more competitive and more automated uh, Q4 that's ahead of us. So wait a sec, if I want to maximize my value per click on every auction, wouldn't that just be Google's max conversion value bidding strategy? Should I just take off rowest targets? I mean, I think that's a fair question that arises because strictly speaking, the answer would be yes. Uh, and the advantages of that are it's a very high aggression level and is very easy to do. But um, I wouldn't switch that on without testing first before going into the holiday season. I wouldn't do much of anything without carefully testing and planning first going into the holidays. You want to have everything nice and stable going in and then be ready to adapt using your expertise, using all of the skills that you have. But also, if you take away return on ad spend, that is one of the most powerful levers that remains right now. Um, that's something that you can do to help pace budget, to help go give Google a signal um, about what you're expecting and what you want to receive in return. Um, so I think it's fully appropriate to have an efficiency target in place. And I wouldn't turn off the rowest target right yet. Instead, I would recommend seasonality adjustments. Um, and a question that comes up is, how do I set a seasonality adjustment? Okay, I know how to do it in the UI, but what is the right value to put in there? Is that a gut feeling? Uh, so a way that you can be more, let's say, data informed here is to uh, basically just look at your historical data. And this is benchmark data that I'm presenting here. It's a lot smoother than your real life account data is likely to be. But the point here is that you can find your standard deviations. You can know what is normal fluctuation in my account and what is actually a seasonal trend. And looking at the past, say, okay, it's reasonable for me to expect on a peak day like Black Friday, for example, uh, in Germany, we see a benchmark value of 38%. That could be different for you depending on your industry and, of course, what geography you're in. But you can calculate a data-driven approach to these uh, seasonality adjustments. And then when we're talking about getting a competitive edge, some of my favorite things to look at here, which I think are underutilized, are auction insights. I mean, they've been available forever, but I don't think anyone is using them to the full extent that they can be. And a newer data point, which is benchmark pricing. Um, I think it's really important to focus on the level of detail here and have a framework in mind, have a mental model. That's how you can really activate that and make it usable. And I also want to call attention to retail category because in performance max, you know, in your, in your standard campaigns, you might have done auction insights reporting at the ad group level. Um, that, that kind of higher level of detail is missing right now. Maybe it'll be coming in the future. But there's a wonderful way of reporting, which is retail category. And this is really interesting because you'll see different competitors depending on which categories you're stepping into. Um, bear in mind, retail category might not be how you define your inventory, but it's how Google understands it. So it's very important. Um, yeah. And for example, here, uh, that's what enabled me in the right hand chart to look at Amazon's impression share, kind of their bidding strength or their robustness um, per, per retail category or per vertical. 
Um, so we can see no surprise that they're really strong in electronics, really strong in health and beauty, not so strong in places like apparel or furniture. But these are the kind of insights that you can get. Who are my competitors at a category level, a retail category level? And then because you might, you might likely have your campaigns organized in a categorical way like that. Um, then I also believe in the importance of having a framework, as I mentioned, a mental model. So I like to take these classic shopping metrics like overlap, outranking, um, and the impression share, and then say, well, what is the big picture? What do these things say together? So I always take inverse outranking share because to me, it fits a little bit more. You can then kind of size how robust a competitor is. Are they overlapping with me in a lot of auctions? And are they outranking me in a lot of auctions? Then that hurts. And the impression share, sometimes a bit of a vanity metric in my opinion, but it shows you how how stable or how hard to move that competitor is. Then when we get to pricing, uh, more important than ever, especially as mentioned, this inflationary environment, because price is the path to demand. And there will be a price elasticity, that relation between price and demand for every given product, every given category, and every given geography, and so on. It's important to understand this. Um, you can also use historical price data from your Google Ads uh, account to see what happened last year, which is what I've done here. You can see that this merchant is kind of heavily discounting through the season, um, whereas the dotted line is the is the average product price. And that started to only dip in like a week before Black Friday. Um, and you can also see that they had a failure of some kind uh, at the end of that cyber week period which caused them to go dramatically over the benchmark price. So that's something that they can be aware of that this was happening last year, it was affecting their performance, and they can make sure it doesn't happen again this year. You can also try to understand generally what is the distribution of my products in terms of benchmark price and how does that correlate to performance. For example, we see that uh, in the lower left-hand chart, their average conversion rate is 2.5%, and you see that uh, everything that's above the benchmark price is starting to perform below that conversion rate benchmark, that average conversion rate. And everything that is to the left of the benchmark price that's cheaper is performing above the conversion rate. So there seems to be a correlation there. But you have to remember that most of the data is concentrated in some narrow areas. That's something to have in mind. But you need to look for these things and try to understand them. It will help you shape your offers. Another question that comes up is Black Friday even worth it, which is a question I ask myself sometimes too. As an American in, in Europe, I sometimes feel bad that we've introduced it because you know the thing about Black Friday is that it does kind of consolidate a lot of demand into this heavily competitive period. And this results in tons of discounting. So some people say, hey, I'm not playing that game or this is purely transactional what's occurring here. I'm not really acquiring new customers or the customers that I'm acquiring, they're just deal hunters. There are valid reasons to question what's going on. But Performance Max has an answer for you. If you're one of those skeptics, you can check out new customer only mode. And that would allow you to say, hey, I'm only going to target new customers with my holiday assets and my holiday campaigns during the seasonal period, because I'm not playing that game. I want to make sure that these are really net new customers for me and that um, I'm not going to be discounting on remarketed customers or something like that. That wouldn't make sense for my business. This is something that you can do. And then you can also check this uh, on the back end on your analytics by taking your transactions and dividing them by the number of users with purchases to see what is the average order frequency. And is that, you know, if it's 2.2 um, would suggest that, you know, this is there's a lot of remarketing going on. If it's 1.1 or 1, ideally, then that means that you're getting a lot of net new customers. Um, so I hope that this information was helpful for you so far. Before I hand over to Susanna, one quick plug. Thanks for hearing me out. You can scan that QR code and it'll take you to my podcast. I've had people on there like Jeannie Marvin, Google Ads um, Liaison for, uh, yeah, or sorry, Product Liaison for Google Ads and lots of other interesting guests. Um, and having said that, I'm going to hand over to, Su to Susanna. Thank you. My name is Susanna Liu, and I'm a global product lead for Performance Max with GMC Feed at Google. Today, I'll briefly take you through an overview of Performance Max, some best practices, 
frequently asked questions, and lastly, a few highlights on our roadmap for PMAX. While the digital-only footprint holds opportunity, one of the key challenges is that user behavior on digital does continue to expand. In this particular study, noting 500 plus touch points before purchase, this is a large and growing number than the manual campaign optimization can no longer manage or scale against. And customers constantly move across different platforms. While well, with this challenge in mind, we have decided to upgrade or um, to expand our smart shopping campaigns to Performance Max, which is the next generation of smart shopping campaigns. Performance campaigns, uh, Performance Max campaign is really similar to smart shopping campaigns where it is a goal-based campaign type, but with all new features, um, including some benefits, for example, um, it will capture the path to purchase journey which um, basically, like I mentioned earlier, it will capture all that different touch points that the user um, is making a purchase throughout their journey. And then lastly, we will actually try to serve on the best inventory possible across Google Ads properties. So what's new with Performance Max? We're bringing to you new formats and new surfaces. So we're expanding to new surfaces like um, YouTube in-stream, text ads, discovery feed, in addition to all the surfaces that you are pretty familiar with on Smart Shopping Campaign. And we're also adding new objectives um, such as online sales, omni bidding, and new customer acquisition. In terms of insights and reporting, we're bringing to you um, such as audience signals, product listing groups reporting, and insights page, which um, actually consists of a lot of insights that will tell you things about your business, um, such as query that will be trending uh, in the upcoming months or weeks. And then lastly, there are some product diagnoses that you can use as well. And some of the features that will be launched um, in the future, so for example, in Q4, and we'll actually touch more or highlight more on the roadmap later as well. But on a high level here, um, we are going to be launching new insights. And then also for A-B testing versus uh, the standard shopping tool, um, the full GA launch will be actually in the experiment page will happen in Q4. And lastly, Performance Planner is a really great tool that you can use for budget planning, especially with the upcoming holiday season. And it's actually launching by the end of Q3 as well. Cool, so to summarize, um, the, these are the main themes um, or key points that are new to Performance Max. So um, more reach, we have more reach across all of Google Ads inventory we have better serving of creatives um, through asset groups and with machine learning. We also have new and improved bidding goals covering various of your business objectives and more insights and transparency helping you strategize your campaigns. And lastly, we are providing you with more tools to steer automation such as audience signals and conversion value goals. And here are some mocks of formats that Performance Max actually serve across. And you can see here, you're probably really familiar with um, on shopping, YouTube, display, search, um, discovery, Gmail, and lastly, maps. And here are some stats um, or uplift study that we really wanted to share with you today. Based on early learning, advertisers who upgraded from smart shopping campaigns to performance max actually see an average of 12% in conversion value at same or better ROAS when compared to their smart shopping campaign performance. All right, next section, I will go through some top best practices and frequently questions with you. So here are four pro tips in Performance Max that I wanted to share with you today. First of all, how to run Performance Max campaigns alongside other campaign types. Second bucket is how to use and structure asset groups. Thirdly, what type of brand safety controls you have. 
And lastly, when should you use URL expansion? We'll deep dive into each of these buckets in the next few slides and bear with me um, for each section. Okay, cool. We are recommending you to run Performance Max alongside your existing Google Ads campaign, such as search, discovery, video, etc. This way you always know you're putting your best foot forward and rest assured you're not inflating your costs in auction. Today, we'll chat more on how Performance Max interacts with your search campaigns. And for best practices, we do recommend to use Performance Max campaign in addition to your existing search campaigns. When a user's query is exactly the same as an eligible search campaign keyword, note that it's exactly the same, it's not just tied to a certain match type, the search campaign will be actually prioritized over Performance Max in this case. Otherwise, the campaign or ad with the highest ad rank will serve. And as an example, as a few examples at the bottom, you can see here, if a user search for S6 shoes and on, in their search campaign, they have the exactly same keyword in exact match form, that in this case, search campaign will actually be prioritized over Performance Max. Similarly, if this user search for the same keyword and you have that keyword in broad match keyword type form in your search campaign, it would also, we would also prioritize search campaigns over Performance Max because the query exactly matches your search campaign keyword. And in the last example, if this user searches access tennis shoes and your search campaign actually does not have a keyword that exactly matches this query, then in this case, the campaign or ad with the higher ad rank will actually serve. Okay, now we have a frequently asked questions of um, why Performance Max campaign is always or is taking over my brand campaign traffic. And as you can see from the previous slide, or as, an, I, as I explained earlier, if your search campaign is set up correctly with no budget constraint, then your search brand campaign should serve as usual with or without Performance Max. Performance Max only takes over when a brand campaign is maxed out and delivers on top um, traffic that would have been missed. If you do still think that Performance Max is taking over your brand campaign, traffic, then you could also add some negative keywords as an extra layer of control. Now next, we always recommend to turn on URL expansion. And what is URL expansion? URL expansion actually helps you optimize performance of your Performance Max campaigns. And by using it, we can replace your final URL with a more relevant landing page and dynamic headline based on your need and intent. This will allow you to actually reach more customers and match to your business throughout your new relevant queries that may not serve through your regular campaigns. And it could also increase ad performance through more relevant ads with the dynamic headlines. So um, here, there are these benefits with the, uh, the final URL expansion, but when should you actually use it? So as an example, if you want to use the best possible performance, you, do, you want the best po possible performance for your campaign, we would recommend to leave final URL expansion on. And if you want good performance, but you don't really want dynamic ads for certain user searches, then we would also suggest to leave it on, but use negative keywords. Okay, next scenario, if you want good performance, but there are some pages that you don't want to send traffic to. I would actually suggest to leave it on and um, have use actually the user, the URL exclusion rules to exclude those pages that you do not want to serve to. And last scenario, if you can only send traffic to a single page, then, um, and that's the only path to your conversion, then that's the only case that I would actually suggest to turn off URL expansion. 
So a frequently asked question is, if URL expansion is opt-in, which pages are eligible to serve text ads? And that's a really quick, good question because a lot of um, people are still confused with it. So if URL expansion on, um, is opt-in, I wanted to emphasize here that URL expansion only affects text ads. So it does not affect your shopping ads if you have a GMC feed attached to your performance max. And in a scenario where URL expansion is off, we only serve text ads on final URL and there will be no product URLs from your GMC feed are targeted in your text ads. And if URL expansion is on, then it's similar to dynamic search ads. So it will target any page on the advertiser's site that are thematically related to the products and likely to perform well for your goal. And in either of these two cases, you may always add a URL exclusion to control which pages to not serve traffic to. So it's pretty convenient. Cool, next I would like to chat a little bit about an asset groups while this is a new concept for performance max, um, while most people were more familiar with ad groups. So an asset groups is actually a set of creatives that will be used to create an ad depending on the channel it's being served on. And an asset provided in an asset group can be combined with any other asset from the same group to create ads um, that will serve across all channels within Google Ads. And you can actually access um, how your ass assets are doing with an ad strengths report. And we have machine learning that will mix and match basically all these creatives and find the best possible combination to serve on your performance, uh, performance max campaign. Now, some of the best practices here is to organize asset groups like how you organize your ad groups for a common theme. So for example, you might be trying to sub separate asset groups by different products or service types that you offer. But to start, it is recommended to have a general as a group that targets all of your products just to make sure that you don't miss any traffic on any of your products. And then in terms of the theme, so for example, here you can see there are as a group one and two that's separated by different categories and or themes, or it could be your ad messaging that you separate these different as a groups by. And in the next two slides, I'll go over two examples of what a structure um, looks like in terms of asset groups. So here is a highly recommended um, structure is to always keep it simple as much as possible. And um, you, it is recommend, like I mentioned earlier, to have a general asset group, which includes all of your products. And you can see from the example here that it is targeting all of the products in this campaign with the first general asset group. And consider using this asset group to highlight seasonal messaging um, or what makes your brand unique. Now, if you want to separate that seasonal messaging or promotional uh, messaging or a specific theme or product line in a separate asset group, that's totally okay too. So you can see from the optional here that you can either have a category specific creative um, in a separate asset group, or you can have like a holiday messaging or a special event or um, say like a flash sale in a separate asset group if you want to just keep that messaging separated. Again, wanted to set, emphasize here again that we highly recommend to have a simple structure with the campaign targeting all products and upload as many relevant creative assets as possible. Next is an advanced campaign structure with asset groups and that divides products into high margin low margin and seasonal products. And of course, this is just an example. So um, you can always kind of customize it or change it according to how you like. But so for example, if you see from the top row, you'll see a high margin product that basically you can set bidding to low ROAS to maximize reach or maximize revenue for these high margin products. And then for the second asset group, 
you can target um, products that are low margin, um, but set them at a high TROS. So you can bid more conservatively on these products with a low margin. And lastly, and optionally, you can also have a group of products that you say you only want to advertise during certain time. So you want to separate out for a seasonal messaging. And you can always test out campaigns and ad group structure until you find um, a good balance or a sweet spot that works the best for you as well. In the last bucket, I would like to chat more on what type of brand safety controls we have on Performance Max. So for example, like I mentioned earlier, you have the placement exclusions where you can add certain URLs to your campaign to exclude these pages that you would not like to serve on. There's also content exclusions where there are certain categories that you do not want to serve to in terms of content. You can also exclude that as well as um, the digital content types. Lastly, we do have keyword negative keyword controls as well. Um, and it's we actually have uh, ready launched it as open beta. So do contact your Google rep if you would like to add certain keywords on the account level for performance max to be excluded in terms of keywords. Right, lastly, I would like to just spend a few minutes on uh, the roadmap highlights that we have. And you can see from here in terms of Q1 and Q2, there are a lot of things that we have already launched. And then this few minutes, I just wanted to focus on a few things that will become upcoming um, either by the end of this quarter or by next quarter and onwards. So if you look at Q3 2022, um, there are a few things that I would like to highlight here. So for example, in terms of store sales goals, um, you'll have access to both store sales bidding and reporting. And then um, as well as seasonal campaigns to drive foot traffic too. This is really important, especially that the holidays are coming up in a few months. And lastly, um, like I mentioned earlier, Performance Planner is coming by the end of this quarter. So I do highly recommend to use this tool to plan for your holiday budget. For Q4 and onwards, um, a few tools that I would like to highlight is that the RSC versus Pmax experiment tool is coming to full launch in Q4. And we're also looking to add MCC level experiments. And that is if you have your standard shopping campaign in one account and then display campaign in a different account or we're looking to give you the ability to compare multiple account, multiple campaigns from different accounts to compare with Pmax campaign. And that is coming up probably in the future um, in next year. Okay, cool, that's it from my end. And thank you so much. I'll pass it back to CSS. So thank you, Susanna. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and just jump us into the Q&A right now. Um, so basically, you know, if you want ask questions before, we'll try to cover those. You can still ask questions now, too. Let's see how many we get to. Um, first up, how many SKUs do you need to make Pmax work? And what is the ideal structure? Um, <clears throat> well, in terms of how many items you need, to, uh, to be honest, you might also think about it from a different angle, like um, how much conversion volume do you have, like how much monthly conversion volume, because you could have um, a very um, large number of, of SKUs with, with small number of conversions each if you're in a high uh, average order value category, for example, or, or the other way around. But generally, um, the more data, the better. Um, I don't work with a ton of, of SMBs, but I'm, I'm hearing from the market that um, you can make Pmax work for for smaller budgets and smaller conversion vo volumes as well. Um, I think on the on the ideal structure, this is where that becomes important because if you have less data, then it's going to be more important to kind of consolidate it or aggregate it, not break it out too granular. Um, just that that you're giving the, the algorithm uh, enough data to work with. Oh, you don't. You just don't want to over segment things um, the way that we used to, right? Um, regarding the ideal structure, 
uh, again, here it depends. Sort of, it's it's going to vary case by case, but I think it makes a, an awful lot of sense to look at some of your product types or looking at your basically your web your web taxonomy and breaking it on that basis. Um, <clears throat> and then it's it's just really a question about difference. You're looking for for meaningful difference in your assortment in your performance, in your audiences. So like, does, does this kind of inventory speak to a different audience, et cetera? Or are these things thematically linked or not? Because assets are the building blocks like the Lego bricks of creatives. And this, is, this whole thing is that you need to offer a thematic guidance here um, toward Performance Max. Then from there, once you've covered that, you can also bring in other kinds of data, like Susanna mentioned, like then you can, um, you could consider having a, you could consider having margin breakouts or seasonal breakouts, et cetera. Um, any number of things you can do there. You want to make sure you've covered your audience and then segment how it makes sense for your business after that, I would say. Um, <clears throat> I've heard different recommendations for campaign structures. What's your, okay. Uh, similar question to, to the last one. What's your recommendation and how does campaign structure affect performance? Um, yeah, definitely. So in terms of trying to impact performance with your campaign structure, um, there's different levels. There's kind of your channel performance, uh, conversion rates and, that, you know, your, your conversion value and that kind of thing, your ROAS. Um, and then you might also think about the performance on the business end, on the back end. Um, so bringing in different kinds of data like what i love one of my favorite examples because it covers both things is to bring in for example like a detailed availability index so not only do i have this product in stock or not but do i have good availability in different sizing or different color variants things like this so that um, this is going to impact the conversion rate um, which improves the channel and it's also good for your business because you don't want to be throwing budget at things with with low stock and low availability then you're just paying to stock out faster and that doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, but yeah a great campaign is going to have just this combination of of covering your audiences and covering your your other business needs i've written an article about it too i can share afterwards maybe uh, what defines new customers as in, is there a way to target new customers that are more likely to stay as customers and not just deal hunters? Well, the, okay. The first question, um, Google has their way of detecting new customers um, in the first place, but then they also recommend that you're giving them customer match lists because this will help them be more accurate. Um, and there's no data that's better than your first party data really. Um, so, is there a way to target new customers that are more likely to stay and not just deal hunters? Yeah, you can consider bringing in things like RFM list, that's uh, recency, frequency, monetary value, or, or looking at customer lifetime value. Um, here, due to the, the targeting options that are available, you can't necessarily directly target those people, but what you can do is look for products that are correlated with high lifetime value. Um, or you can try to identify products that appear to be order openers and, you know, they're generating good average order values, or yeah, you've associated that with retention in your CSS and your CRM, whatever the case might be. Um, that, that's probably one of the best ways to go about that from my perspective. Can you explain again, how to use analytics to check if you actually generated new customers with new customer acquisition? Um, sure, so I'm not a deep analytics pro, by the way, I should qualify that. Um, but the, the, in a nutshell, what I was proposing with average order frequency is to, is to look at basically the, the ratio of um, your, your transactions and your, and your new users and <clears throat> try to determine from the analytics data, like, do I do I have uh, a lot of repeat customers coming in, or does it seem like I've got a lot of um, a lot of customers that only have single orders associated with them, and so on? Like this would be the way you can just look at our ratio basis to try to figure this out. But I'm sure there's some very clever analytics tracking and testing things out there um, as well. 
For reasons of performance, we canceled some inventory from Google in the past as they were not close to a purchase. Could this be possible for Pmax too? Uh, not every reach is valuable. Yeah, I've got your point. Definitely um, some of the, what we might call like high funnel inventory or more ad inventory or more generic ad inventory. Um, you might see that there's a lower intent here. I mean, again, Google's kind of value proposition is that um, they've got other signals that can help determine the, uh, the intent and that they're going to help sort of nurture that person along as well. So also think about your conversion window and, and stuff like that. <coughs> but um, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the clock. I think we're over time. So I'm going to let's keep going, though, and answering questions. And if you can stay, you can stay. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us. Um, but yeah, it could definitely be for, possible for Pmax. Absolutely. And Susanna was saying it. you can exclude certain kinds of placements. There are exclusion capabilities um, for like mobile app categories or, or different kinds of inventory that you might not be satisfied with. You can take measures to control that. You can also in the campaign creation, the way you create it, you can decide I'm going to exclude certain types of, types of assets um, or not. But I would say excluding placements is a, is a good place to start there. What does more reach mean exactly? Um, will Google automatically expand my, my audience targeting? And is there a way we can set up who I want to target in Pmax campaigns? <clears throat> okay, this is a bit related to a couple of the things we talked about so far. Like more reach means more reach in two ways, I guess. Um, it should be reaching customers that you wouldn't be reaching with a standard campaign. And you should also get more touch points on the customers that you are reaching. Uh, there should be that possibility by having more services activated, more ad inventory, basically. Um, but yeah, Google is going to automatically expand your audience targeting. Targeting or audience signals, that's why they're called like signals here, not um, targeting per se. You can think of it the, the way I always think about it in my head. Maybe it's not the best way, but it's like, okay, I'm listening to a Spotify playlist. It's only going to play these songs. That would be targeting. Or I'm going to start listening to one song and then I'm going to let Spotify's algorithm recommend new songs to me uh, based on my listening history and stuff like that. So that's a bit more the, the operating model here with, with the audiences is that the algorithm is going to find lookalikes and so on. It's going to expand on there. What you can do is refresh the audience list as you go along, but bear in mind it's additive or cumulative, um, but you can definitely refresh it. How can I exclude keywords from a performance max campaign? Um, <clears throat> well, as, as Susanna mentioned toward the end there, um, there's this beta coming out for account level exclusions. Um, I'll also mention that if you're working with a CSS partner, like us, for example, or a CSS partner, um, you know, we can help you get campaign level exclusions. It's not, uh, it's not uh, as automated. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a workaround, but we can reach out to our CSS reps and get campaign level exclusions for you. And good. I think uh, that's the last question for right now. So we'll wrap it up there. I want to say thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone who listened and joined. Thanks again to Google for organizing and especially Susanna for joining us and sharing all that awesome information. And we'll see you next time.